But it's nice to be back. It's nice to be doing comedy in front of people again. Uh, during the lockdown, I was still doing comedy. I was doing comedy on Zoom, the meeting app. Yeah, that should have been illegal <laughs> while they were banning things. Yeah, I was doing comedy on that. I was doing what I'm doing right now, except in my living room, sitting on my couch, doing comedy into my laptop screen. And I'll be honest with you, if that's what comedy was when I started, I would have gone to college, all right? <laughs> I would have been like, let's see what books have in store, because this isn't for me, you know? I was doing comedy in my living room. Here's something you may not know about comedians, but if we bomb at a venue, we just don't go back to that venue, okay? <laughs> There's plenty of bars and restaurants I bombed in coming up. I've never stepped foot back into because they hurt my heart, all right? <laughs> in fact, when I drive by, I flip them all so they know. <laughs> they know I'm not over. But during the pandemic, I was bombing in a place I pay to live at. <laughs> so I can't even leave for at least 30 days. And the next morning, I'd have to wake up and make coffee and just look like, yep, that's where I lost my dignity, right over there. <laughs> 10 paces that away. And I tried to make the best of it. I asked everyone to put their microphones on so you can hear the laughter. It's very important to hear laughs when you do comedy, because comedy without laughter just sounds like I'm reading a manifesto, all right? <laughs> it's very important to hear the ha ha ha, because if you don't, you're like, I feel like we were supposed to report this. <laughs> this is not okay. <laughs> Yeah, I remember I did two company Christmas parties a couple Decembers ago on Zoom. The first one was at one in the afternoon, which that also should have been illegal. You can't do comedy at one in the afternoon, all right? The sun's out, God's watching. It's not where it's meant to be. It's meant to be in a pizza shop, <laughs> in like in dark quarters. This is how comedy's meant to be. But I'm doing a company Christmas party on Zoom at one in the afternoon. I asked everyone to put their microphones on so I could hear the laughter. And there's a lady, I can tell by her voice, is a little bit older. She doesn't have her screen on. It just says Nancy on the screen. <laughs> but I could tell by her voice, a little bit older. She had her microphone on and I think she forgot it was on. Cause like two minutes into my set, I hit a big punchline and everybody laughed. And for a millisecond, I'm like, okay, this feels normal. This feels good. As soon as the laughter died down, Nancy, who doesn't realize her microphone's on, goes, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I gotta get to Costco. And that got a bigger laugh than whatever the hell I just said. And I still had 45 more minutes to do. So I'm just sitting on my couch sweating, going, damn you, Nancy. Really taking the wind out of my sails. Such a bummer. That wasn't even the worst I had it. I had a second company Christmas party that same day. And I don't know if you've ever been on a Zoom meeting, but when you're talking, you're the big square. And my audience was their little squares, right here. And I had an audience member leave my show by just closing their laptop screen. <laughs> Do you get why that hurts extra? Like, does that make sense? She could have hit a button and disappeared. Left me in wonder, like, oh, maybe her Wi-Fi went out. But she just closed her laptop screen in the middle of me doing the only thing I'm good at. And I just had to watch that. And that was the only one that saw. And I had to keep doing comedy. And I'm like, man, I hope we go back to normal. <laughs> we did. It's good to be back, man. It's nice. I uh, vaccinated. I don't care if you are. I want to make that clear. I know that's just such a distinction. I'm back. Are you back? Boosted? <laughs> yeah, I got all of them. Well, do you care what I... I don't care what you have. I don't. I got vaxxed. I, uh, nothing crazy happened to me. My poor fiance ended up having a panic attack during the second shot. It wasn't her fault. She actually had a nurse that told her, hey, it's my first time ever giving the vaccine. <laughs> Which, I don't work in the medical field, but that sounds like day one stuff. That sounds like stuff you learn day one. You don't tell anyone it's your first day doing anything. You lie to that person and you go, you're in luck, I'm the greatest there's ever been. But that's not who she had. She had someone just shooting syringes off going, it's my first time giving the vaccine like a Yosemite Sam. Just bang, 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 let's get it going. And my fiance is like, what? And then she stuck her with it and then she pulled it out and left her thumb on her arm for an uncomfortably long time. Like long enough for her to go, uh, is everything okay? And she's like, what? Yeah, everything's great. Uh, you're just bleeding a lot more than we expected. <laughs> And then she called over to a nurse. She's like, do you have that gauze? Just bring the whole box. And they wrapped her up with like a Civil War wound on her arm. And they sent her off to the quarantine area. And we couldn't sit next to each other. It was full like this. 
And so now she's texting me everything I just told you guys. And my response was, hey, listen, that sucks. I'm so sorry that happened to you, but you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. Just don't let it go to your head. If it goes to your head, then you won't be okay. She's like, you're absolutely right. I won't let it go to my head. And I'm like, that's my girl. And then about three minutes later, she texts me. She's like, it's in my head. And I'm like, are you all right? And she's like, no, I'm dying. And I was like, that's fast. All right, I thought this would have taken longer. But the hero that I am, I sprung out of my seat. I'm like, I'm going to get help. I ran up to the first person who looked important. He had a lanyard. I'm like, excuse me, my fiance's dying. The vaccine did it. Bring everybody. Because I know how to get help. You have to yell fire. And I yelled fire. And that guy brought everybody. He brought a doctor, a nurse, and like a third guy in a suit. I don't know who that guy was. I think he was just a PR guy for Moderna. Because he kept very loudly saying to my fiance, no, 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 ma'am, you felt like this before you got here. Just to calm everybody else down, because everyone's looking at her going, what's in this stuff? We also took a wheelchair from an elderly person. That also happened. That also happened. There was one wheelchair in this entire vaccination site, and they ran up to her, and they're like, ma'am, you got to figure your legs out, because this girl needs it. We booted a senior citizen from her wheelchair. We even had the doctor take her blood pressure, and the doctor goes, wow, your blood pressure's really low. You're about to faint. And I'm like, what is the matter with you? <laughs> Lie! This isn't the time for the truth. Why would you tell someone they're about to faint? Lie to them. Go, yeah, things are looking good. What? No, 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 I'm not bracing for anything. You're doing great. <laughs> Lie to them. But this guy's like, you're about to faint. My fiance's like, I feel it. And she's just <laughs> melting into her seat. It took like a half hour and three bottles of water, but she, she finally started feeling better. And the doctor goes, hey, listen, we don't like to call it this in the medical field, but you had what they refer to as a panic attack. You're perfectly fine. It was in your head. You can go home. And on the way home, she's like, man, I'm so embarrassed. I had a panic attack in front of all those strangers. And I'm like, you shouldn't be embarrassed about that. That wasn't your fault, all right? Same thing would have happened to me. If I sat down and that nurse was like, it's my first time ever giving the vaccine, I would have been like, uh, no, it won't be. <laughs> Because I'll wait. I'll wait for anybody else. Anybody else. I don't care if they're a nurse. I'd rather a junkie from under the bridge give me my vaccine. <laughs> Is there anyone here with some experience with needles? I'd rather a junkie from under the bridge. It's like, what? A shot? I got you, baby. And then you just stick me with it. I'll walk them through it. I'll be like, you can put your belt back on. All right? We're not, we're not listening to jazz right now. We're just getting the vaccine. <laughs> That's my vaccine story. It's weird. It's fun that we hate each other over it. That's a weird one. I had a buddy of mine get mad at me. He goes, why the hell did you get the vaccine? And I was honest with him. I was like, I got the vaccine because I don't know anything. <laughs> All right. I didn't go to college. I graduated high school with a 2.75 GPA. I'm not smart. I'm not dumb. I'm a regular. Huh? <laughs> a regular guy and some nerds popped up on my TV and they're like you should get the vaccine I'm like okay <laughs> that's the end of the reason and my buddy's like why the hell did you get that vaccine I'm like the nerds didn't you hear the nerds and he's like yeah I heard the nerds but I also listened to a jujitsu podcast and they recommended I reconsider and I was like fine I went with the nerds you went with the jujitsu guy why are we fighting <laughs> That's the part I didn't understand. Why are we arguing about it, you know? And then we talked about it some more. And I'm like, you know what? I totally get why, like, a UFC fighter wouldn't want the vaccine. I get it. Because I've never assaulted a man in my underwear. But it must make you feel amazing. <laughs> Can you imagine the self-esteem that must build to assault another man in his underwear? And he both trained eight weeks for that moment. And you beat him up so bad, a third man had to run in and go, please stop, you're going to kill him. <laughs> And then when he did, 20,000 people in an arena went, ah! You ever see a UFC fighter after a win? He looks like a Spartan after a battle. He just, ah, his genitals are vibrating. And then that guy goes home with that self-esteem, turns on the news, and some nerd on there is like, you better get the vaccine, because there's a virus that might make you go, <coughs> till you die. He's like, well, not me. Did you see what I just did to that man? I think I'll be OK. And I agree, I think he will be okay. <laughs> but me, I need the vaccine. I need it, I know it. Cause one time I turned too quickly. <laughs> we got any quick turners in here? 
I was at a comedy club. I was in the back. I went to turn. There's a waitress in my blind spot. I almost knocked into her. I had to stop. And when I stopped, I pulled a muscle in my neck that went down to my shoulder. And for the next two weeks when I was driving, I had to change lanes based on faith, all right? I had to decide how badly I needed to get to that Walmart. And I'm like, here we go. <laughs> I need the vaccine. I don't have the genetic makeup to survive this thing. I just don't have it. <laughs> 34, man. I'm 34. This is the first year I've noticed that my body's changing. 34 isn't old. I'm not trying to say it is. It's just the first year I've noticed. You know? It's the first year I've noticed. 34 has been the first year I've noticed that I can ruin an entire day if I have too much lunch. <laughs> Am I alone on this? Like, if I finish that entire plate at noon, we gotta cancel the rest of the day. Because I gotta go lay down. I did not realize how much cheese was on that burger. And I have to lay down for a while. It's just changing. I love craft beer. I can have one craft beer. I can have one. I can have one craft beer. If I have two, I have to run home to use the bathroom, all right? And my friends are like, they have a bathroom here. Not for what I'm about to do. Get the hell out of my way, all right? They don't have what I need at this brewery with one toilet. Vacate the premise. It's so good, man. I don't know, I spent a lot of the pandemic working on myself. I don't know if you can tell, I've been working on my posture, trying to stand up straight, you know? Only reason I'm doing that is because I was scrolling Instagram and they had an ad asking if you were slouching. <laughs> and I was. I was on there like, are you slouching right now? And I looked in the mirror and sure enough, I was like this. And I'm like, how closely are you watching me? <laughs> and what they were trying to do was sell you these rubber bands that go around your shoulders and they make you stand <laughs> like a guy that you hate. You know these dudes? <laughs> You know these dudes with like too much posture? They just come into every room, just shoulders and Adam's apple. Sometimes named Trevor, may or may not run a CrossFit gym. Not trying to get too specific, but you know. So I almost bought these rubber bands, because I want to stand up straight. But then I remembered I have mental strength. I could just remind myself to stand up straight. So that's what I started doing. Before I'd leave the house, I'd look in the mirror and go, all right, Zoltan, tits up, here we go. <laughs> Oh, marvelous Mrs. Maisel, let's get it going. And you know what I learned from standing up straight? Standing up straight hurts my back. Right now, there's pain in my spine. Right where all the bones meet, very uncomfortable. You know what feels good? This right here. This right here has never hurt me once. Never once have I been like this going, ooh, we gotta straighten out. I think this is where we're supposed to be. You know who I think had it right? That dude in the middle of the evolutionary chart? You know what I'm talking about, the cavemen? On one end, there's the dude crawling, at the other end, the Trevor, just walking all up, right? But if you look in the middle, there's just a dude with a healthy slouch. I think that's where we're supposed to be, and we overcorrected. This is where you're supposed to be. Look out for this posture. Make friends with this guy. This is a good dude. This is the posture of a good man. This man will pick you up from the airport. You know? He'll be early. He'll have Starbucks ready. This is a good guy. This dude, he will try to sleep with your girlfriend when you're gone on that trip. He has way too much confidence. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about standing up straight. I'm not gonna live up to Instagram standards of spinal cords. <laughs> Mine has a bit of a hitch in it. And that's the way it's gonna be, you know? Cause I'm body positive. I love the body positivity movement. I don't know if you guys know what the body positivity movement is, but if you don't, it's where your body sucks, but you love it anyway. <laughs> What a genius idea. Why did that take so long to become something? It makes so much sense. Just love your body. Okay. Well, that guy's got a better one. Yeah, well, you're not him, so you better love yours. It makes so much sense. Love your body. I wish he was around when I was younger. I wish he was around when I was a chubby 12-year-old wearing a T-shirt in the pool. I could have used some body positivity then. I thought I looked slim, and you know I didn't. That was the chubbiest I ever looked. I would just step out of that pool, that shirt hugging my voluptuous curves. 
Not anymore. I was at the beach last week. I took my shirt off. I don't care if my nipples don't match. I'm out there, all right? <laughs> Body positivity. My only critique of body positivity, and I think it will evolve over time, but I hope one day body positivity can move north to include the face. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have noticed, body positivity seems to cut off right around here. <laughs> From here down, you need to love your body. That's your body. From here up, oh yeah, you gotta fix that. <laughs> You're like, why? It's totally connected. No, it isn't. <laughs> Don't mess with your face, you guys. You have a beautiful face. Your face tells your story, okay? Two people came together, they made love, and this is the receipt. <laughs> this is what you got. I like it, only a few of you laughed. Everyone else is like, my parents are ugly. He should shut up. <laughs> if I wanna iron out some of these dents and divots, I will, man. <laughs> Live your life. Thank you, I like that. That was good. <laughs> Appreciate it. I don't know. I spent a lot of the pandemic working on me, standing up straight, slouching, everything. I started going to therapy a few months ago. Anyone go to therapy in here? A couple people right in the front. Are you taking it or teaching it? Which one are you taking it? All right. It's very important to figure out which end of the couch, you know? I'm on your side of the couch. I'm new at it, I've only been going for a few months, but I started going to therapy when I made the realization that this, what I'm doing right now, this is how I prefer to share my feelings. <laughs> this is how I prefer to share my thoughts and feelings. I prefer to be elevated and illuminated and amplified. <laughs> and I like it to be frowned upon if you interrupt me. <laughs> that's, that's where I feel comfortable. And once I made that realization, I'm like, I gotta run this by somebody. Because that doesn't sound normal. That sounds like the making of a narcissist. So I started going to therapy. And if you've never been to therapy, I can explain it like this. Going to therapy is like going to a job interview where you have to be honest. Imagine that. Imagine going to a job interview. You can't do those little lies. You know those little lies? Like, what's your biggest flaw? <laughs> I care too much. <laughs> you know those little dumb lies you do? Like, oh, you're gonna have to kick me out at five. I'm a company man. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine going into that same job interview, but being honest, walking in and just going, oh yeah, I'm just taking this till anything else comes along. <laughs> Two week notice? <laughs> no, we're not doing that. <laughs> That's what going to therapy is like. Going to therapy is like going to a job interview where you have to be honest, except at the end of the interview, they never tell you if you got the job. <laughs> like the first time I went, I came home, my fiance was like, how was it? I'm like, I don't think I got it. <laughs> but I have another interview next week, so we're gonna, we're gonna figure this out. <laughs> talk about a lot of things in therapy. We talk about depression. I have what I like to call a healthy level of depression. You know, just right here. Just enough to keep me humble and likable. Just a regular guy. You ever meet someone who could use a little depression? You know what I mean? Just those obnoxiously positive people. Every day is an opportunity. Like, he could use a sprinkling of depression. Carpe diem, he could use a dusting of depression. He could use a parking ticket on a rainy day. He could use something to bring him down, you know? I have a healthy level of depression. Like, I would never kill myself, but I would like to die naturally soon. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, I wouldn't do it, but can we pick a day? Just tell me where to be, you know? It's a healthy level of depression. Like, if I was on a plane and it was going down, I'd scream, but I wouldn't be the loudest. <laughs> You know, I'd scream enough so no one got suspicious that I'm the reason it's going down. But I wouldn't be dramatic about it, you know? It's a healthy level. It's important. <laughs> I like it. Glad we're getting back to normal. I miss it. I miss everything about it. I miss traveling. I miss hotels, oddly enough. I love staying at hotels. I stay at them a lot. I'm a Marriott Bonvoy Titanium Elite member. Yeah. <laughs> Not trying to flex on you guys, but when I check into a hotel, I get a free bottle of water. <laughs> the rest of you, that's five dollars. But for me, I stayed at a hundred Marriott properties in a calendar year, so that's the privilege I earned. 
I love it. I love my statuses, because that's all I have. I never went to college. I don't have a diploma on the wall to show you that I know what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> all I have are my little statuses. I'm a Delta Platinum Medallion member. I'm a national rental car, just take it guy. <laughs> that's not the official term, but that's essentially what it is. I don't go to the counter. I just get in a car like I'm stealing it, and I leave. <laughs> I'm a Bank of America preferred member. Yeah. You don't know what that one means? That means if you and me go to Bank of America, they prefer to see me, all right? Like, they're cool with you being there. They're not going to kick you out right away, but they're pumped to see me. They're like, hell yeah, Zoltan's here. This is our guy. Get those free pens ready. But I've only been a Bank of America preferred member for the last couple of years. But I've been with Bank of America since 2003 when I got my first job. And for the first 15 years, Bank of America used to charge me $12 a month because I didn't make enough money. <laughs> and I used to call them up and I'd be like, hey, can you quit charging me 12 bucks a month? And they're like, we have to, you don't have enough money. And I'm like, you realize how counterproductive this is, right? Like, I'm not insane. And they're like, yeah, it's our policy. We just have to do it. That's crazy. That's like if you went to the doctors with a broken arm and he's like, ah, I'm gonna have to kick you in the nuts. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, it's our policy. I just got to right up the center there. Well, then will you fix my arm? No. No. It's staying how it is. But now I'm a preferred member, so they don't charge me the 12 bucks a month anymore. And now one of the perks of being a preferred member is I can stick my debit card into any ATM, and they don't charge me the service fee. Okay, so now that's the only place I stick my debit card. Anytime I see an ATM that doesn't say Bank of America on it, like, my eyes light up. I'm like, suck on that right there. It's gonna take a while, but I'm gonna make up for 15 years worth of $12 a month fees. Bank of America messes with the wrong man, all right? They didn't think I was gonna turn this franchise around, but here we are. If you ever read in the news that Bank of America's going out of business, look no further, all right? put them down $20 at a time. <laughs> but yeah, I love it. I love checking into hotels. I like the familiarity of it. You walk in, they go, what's your name? And you go, Zoltan Cassis. And they go, ah, we were expecting you. And you're like, I know, I made the reservation. <laughs> and they give you the keys and the water and I dance off to my room. And I love the familiarity of it. Every once in a while though, I'll check in and there's like a sad guy working behind the counter and there's more conversation than needs to be, you know? <laughs> I was doing the show in Phoenix earlier in the year and I checked into the hotel and the guy's like, uh, what's your name? And I'm like, it's all Dan Cass. He's like, oh, we were expecting you. I'm like, I know, I made the reservation. And he goes, what brings you to Phoenix? And I'm like, oh no, that's not part of this at all. That's not part of this at all. But anytime someone asks what brings me to town, I always want to look him in the eyes and goes, nefarious activities. How do you feel about that? Do you want to be an accomplice? How into this do you want to be? He goes, what brings you to Phoenix? And I just go, work, work. You can tell by the way I said that. It was just a dot. Work, period. Not dot, 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 like there's more text to come. We're done with the conversation. And he goes, what do you do for work? And I'm like, you son of a bitch. All right. Let's get into it. Here's something you need to know about me. I have wavering confidence. Some days my confidence is high. I'll tell you I'm a stand-up comedian. Other days it's low. That day it was low. I just driven through desert for six hours. I'm wearing sweatpants. My hair's messed up. I don't want to tell this guy I'm a comedian because by the looks of it, it's not going well. All right? <laughs> so he goes, what do you do for work? And I just blurted out, computers. <laughs> and as soon as I said it, I'm like, damn, nothing sounds less like I work with computers <laughs> than just blurting out the word computers. <laughs> He's gonna need more. That's not gonna end it, right? There's no way. That sounds like I don't even know how to plug it in. That sounds like I work inside of a computer, like from the 50s, like, yeah, I changed the oil on computers. They're the size of rooms, you know, man. <laughs> and he goes, what do you do with computers? And I'm like, I don't, what? 
I'm trying to remember everything, like every job, and I can't think of one. So now I'm thinking of everything I do with a computer, and none of it's a job, okay? <laughs> everything I do with computers, it's like email, social media, fantasy football, nothing. And then he actually helps me. He's like, do you work in IT? And I'm like, that's exactly what I do. I work in IT. And he goes, what company do you work for? And I'm like, I'm going to burn the building to the ground. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Have you ever lied so much you felt the need to let out a little bit of the truth just so you can look in the mirror at the end of the day? That's where I was at. So he's like, what company do you work for? I was like, I'm self-employed, right? A little bit of the truth, but not all of it, right? And he goes, I didn't know you could do that in IT. And I'm like, well, ta-da! It's happening right in front of you. Self-employed IT guy. And then he goes, I've always been interested in getting into that. And I'm like, I will drown you in a bucket if you don't give me my key. I'm kidding, I didn't say that. Instead, I just stared at him without blinking until he slid the key over. And then I walked back to the lobby and my fiance was waiting for me. She's like, what took so long? I'm like, I don't know, for some reason I told the guy I work in computers. And now I feel like there's gonna be a resume slid under our door for a company I don't actually have. You know, I think if I would have told him I was a comedian, it would have ended the conversation. I think that would have been the quickest thing if I just walked in disheveled. What brings you to Phoenix? I'm a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I would have moved it along. I would have rather that situation than what I had the next night. The next night I was performing in Tucson, Arizona at Hotel Congress, which is like a historic hotel that some hipsters bought, and they've turned it into like a music venue and like a coffee shop and a bar, and it was still a hotel upstairs. And a couple weeks before I was set to do the show, they emailed me and they're like, hey, since you're coming out to perform, would you like a complimentary hotel room? And I was like, absolutely, that's so nice of you. And then we showed up, and it's a historic hotel. Like when we checked in, they gave us a key, like a real key. Like a feel free to put that on your cell phone, it's not gonna do anything, <laughs> key. And I'm like, oh, we're in for something. Because I have never stayed at a hotel with a key before. And I'm like, this is, okay. And then we go in, it's a historic hotel, all right? It's old, it's just a room with a bed and a desk and a window, that's it. There's no TV, no nothing. And my fiance starts Googling the hotel and she finds out that Hotel Congress is one of the most haunted hotels <laughs> in all of America. And now I'm like, wow, that hospitality not so hospitable anymore now, is it? <laughs> I see why you had some vacancies. <laughs> and my fiance is Googling the hotel and it's apparently very haunted. Like each room has its own Wikipedia entry almost. Like, oh, in room 238, there's a woman that just stands at the foot of your bed. In room 240, your bed may levitate above the ground. In room 245, the mobster John Dillinger was shot and killed. And I'm like, quit reading. You're getting close to our room. <laughs> I don't want to know. So that night we do the show, we come back to the hotel and we're trying to sleep, but we can't sleep, we've done too much research, you know? <laughs> so we're just over there pretending to sleep and there's no TV. Usually the TV is my defense against ghosts. Like if I'm staying, <laughs> right? If you think a room's haunted, you leave TV on. That's what I do, I leave Sports Center on because in my mind that keeps the ghosts away. <laughs> like if they come by, they're like, oh, he's not sleeping, he's still watching sports highlights. <laughs> and then they float off to the next room. That's my defense, you know? But this room didn't have a TV. So it was just me and my fiance in a tiny bed like this. We're, we're pretending to sleep, but no one's sleeping, okay? Every five minutes, we're like, did you hear that? What was that? Was that you? Was that me? Tell me. So we're doing all night. And then at three in the morning, we heard a very loud cough. Very loud, wet, just <laughs> Just an unvaccinated cough. <laughs> and it was so loud and it was weird. I couldn't tell what year it came from. <laughs> like it could have came from a hundred years ago. It could have came from this year. I also couldn't tell where it came from. It came from everywhere and nowhere. All at the same time. Could have came from outside or the room behind us or the right next to the bed. And after I heard that wet cough, I felt someone standing on my side of the bed right here. And my defense to that as a 34-year-old man was to close my eyes tighter. 
because I didn't hear a door open or close. So clearly, whatever's over here, I can't fist fight. So I was just laying here, and I just heard, and I went, I'm making none of this story up. After I go, I feel a pressure here on my hip, and then it goes right there. And it gave me three how do you do's. And at that point, I'm trying to scream my fiance's name. But it's like a horror movie. I have no voice in my throat. Her name's Emma. It should be the easiest name on the planet to scream, but I have nothing in my voice. I'm trying to say Emma, but all that's coming out is And then finally, I get it together. I go, Emma, and I throw the blanket. She wakes up. She goes, what happened? Are you okay? Did you have a bad dream? I'm like, it was no dream. I was just molested by a ghost. And she's like, are you serious? I'm like, yes, I'm serious. I'm like, did you hear that wet cough? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, I think he did it. She's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, give me three how do you do's. And I asked her, I'm like, did you touch me? She's like, no, my hands are over here. She's like, did you touch yourself? And I'm like, no, my hands are up here. This guy gave me three pumps. And she goes, oh my God, we, we have to report it. <laughs> to who? Who do you report that to? Am I supposed to find the ghost of a dead sheriff? Who do you report that to? Ah, oh, yeah, we've been looking for him for years. Can't keep him locked up. No one's willing to take the stand. <laughs> Everything I told you in that story was true, and it was terrifying. Oh, we didn't go back to sleep after that, clearly. We just laid in bed, waited for the sun to come up, and then we skedaddled. And that happened the first week of January. Here we are in April, and I've been obsessed with ghosts, all right? Clearly, I used to never be a ghost guy, but now I'm in. Obviously, I've been touched, right? <laughs> I am into that world now. That is what I do. So now I'm obsessed with ghosts. I watch all the documentaries, I read all the blogs, and I learn, you know? I know now. Like, my fiance and I are trying to buy a house. We're on Zillow. Anytime I see a house with a price cut, I'm like, that's because there's a demon in that house. <laughs> We're not even looking at it. He might attach ourselves, and then we got to bring a medium over, some weird hair. He's got to play with a Ouija board to get rid of it. We're not doing any of that. Main thing I learned about ghosts is that they're not always scaring you. You know, they're not always just jumping out going, ooh, booga booga, hey, how do you like that? <laughs> they're not always doing that. Usually they're just hiding, watching you when you think you're alone. When you think you're alone at home, just dancing to Spotify, butt naked, if you're not, there's someone there just. <laughs> and once I made that realization, I remembered what my fiance and I did in that room when we first checked in. So earlier that day, I worked out at the hotel gym in Phoenix, and it was an early morning workout, and I was very sweaty, and we went straight to breakfast afterwards, so I didn't have time to shower. So I just dried naturally in the desert air, and that gave me a bit of a chafy taint, all right? Just a little bit of a, just a, don't you dare pull back on me right now. Like, don't even act like I'm the only one in history that's ever had a little situation down there. That dry desert air, a little bit of moisture, some wind went up there, and it got weird, all right? <laughs> and so when we checked into the hotel in Tucson, I was like, ugh, I, don't know, I, gotta... I asked Emma, I'm like, hey, did you bring the Vaseline? And she's like, yeah, I got it. And she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I got a bit of a rashy taint. Because <laughs> I dried naturally in the desert air. And I, I need it, because I got to perform for the good people of Tucson. I can't go out there the way I am. They're going to know that I'm not as smooth as I usually am. <laughs> you know? They're going to know that there's a stutter in my gait, that something's <laughs> matter. And she's like, don't worry, baby. I got you. Get naked. Hop on the bed. So I did, I ripped all my clothes off, I jumped on the bed, and I'm laying there, holding my toes. In, I believe it's called a happy baby position for all you yogis out there. So I'm just holding my toes, and then my fiance, the love of my life that she is, the partner that she is, my confidant, she dabbed me up with a little bit of Vaseline, because that's what love looks like sometimes, all right? It's not always walking hand in hand down the beach as the sun is setting. Sometimes you're going, lift it, and then... But now, knowing that I, what I know, looking back on that situation, while she's lubing me up, there's probably the ghost of John Dillinger in the corner, just... 
That's why I don't go to heaven right there. You don't see that kind of action on the other side of the pearly gates. You gotta be right here on planet Earth for that kind of money. Thanks so much for laughing at all that. I've had some audiences not laugh at that whole chunk, and that is hard. I talk about the ghost, I talk about the taint, and they just stare at me like, none of that will we relate to. It's hard, man. But it's nice, it's nice to, <laughs> it's nice to be back, I, I don't know. I'm trying to figure my life out, you know? I'm 34, turning 35 next month, and I don't know, I wanna like, I'm a renter, you know? That's where I'm at. Any renters out there, clap it up if you rent. Yeah, those are my people right here. That's good. Homeowners, let me hear you. Homeowners. Yeah. All right. And that right there, uh, those are the two political parties in America right now. <laughs> A lot of people think it's Republicans and Democrats. It is not. It is homeowners and filthy renters. <laughs> Filthy, not getting their deposit back renters and highfalutin one percenter homeowners. <laughs> and they make us hate each other. Meanwhile, Bank of America stays quiet in the corner. <laughs> but I'm a renter, I wanna be a homeowner. I wanna have those confident claps. Did you hear those claps? Those are some good, you heard the pop in them. Those were confident, those came from well moisturized hands right there, didn't it? Just pop, 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 I want that. Did you hear the renter claps? A little dusty, all right? Those are some sandy claps. I want to be a homeowner. I want to be a homeowner just so I can say that sentence. So I can look someone in the eye and go, get off my property. I think that's the best part of being a homeowner, looking at someone and just going, get off my property. Because you can't say that confidently as a renter, you know? Because you don't know, he may know the landlord. Someone who walks into my front yard, I got to go out there and be like, uh, do you know Shafiq? <laughs> and depending on his answer, I gotta readjust my attack. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna own, I don't know if it's gonna happen. I feel like I'm at a real crossroads in my life where one or the other could happen. It's a real coin toss. Like I was doing a show in La Jolla and I was driving through and I was looking at all these mansions. I'm fantasizing. I'm like, you know, I could see comedy maybe one day getting to a level where I could live in one of them big ass houses. You know? And then later that day, I was driving through my neighborhood and I watched a homeless man beating a bird scooter with a stick. And I'm like, I could also see that happening just as clearly. Like it's one or the other. And I really don't know what it's gonna be, but no matter what it is, I'm gonna have a lot of passion. All right? If I have a mansion, I'm coming out of there in a bedazzled robe, wooing like Ric Flair. And if I'm homeless, I will also be wooing just without the bedazzled robe. Same energy, different attire. That's all that matters. We got a big homeless issue down where I live. I live down in the Kensington neighborhood. We got a big homeless issue. We talk about it on the Nextdoor app. I don't know if you guys are on the Nextdoor app, but that's the app where you find out you hate the neighbor you've never met. <laughs> Like, I didn't even know that guy, but now I do, and I hate him. <laughs> but we argue about a home, the homeless problem every, all the time. We're like, whose fault is it? Is it your fault? Is it my fault? Is it their fault? I don't think it's anyone's fault. It's like we all forgot playing Monopoly as children. That's all that's going on out there. Remember, like, later in a Monopoly game? Remember, like, an hour into a Monopoly game? There'd be one guy killing it, another guy doing okay, a third one hanging on, and then your uncle just walking around in the kitchen <laughs> looking for something to eat because he already ran out of money. That's all that's going on out there. They're all just walking around looking for something to eat because they ran out of money, and they're looking at us, waiting for us to join them, but we're still at the board game looking at them going, good Lord, come on, Bitcoin, here we go. I don't want to live in a van unless I have to. <laughs> Want it to be by choice. <laughs> but it's bad where I live. They're like right outside my front door. I open my door, there's a homeless dude. It makes me wonder like, how good are we doing? <laughs> you know, I turn to my fiance, I'm like, are we homeless? She's like, no, we're good. I'm like, are you sure? Cause they're right there. <laughs> like the only thing between us is a, <laughs> We moved into a nice place, and as soon as we moved in, my fiance was like, hey, I want you to buy a security system for the house 
so I can feel safe when you travel. And that was the first time I found out that she felt safe when I was home. I had no idea. I was like, you feel safe when I'm at home? She's like, yeah, and I'm like, stop it. You cut it out. I don't feel safe when I'm at home. But she's like, yeah, we should get this ring doorbell system. So I looked it up and we bought it. We spent $800 on a three camera shoot of me coming home. <laughs> That's all the video I have. I have some great footage of me entering the premises. And every video is the same. It's me opening the front gate and then my phone starts buzzing saying, there's movement at your front door. There's movement. And the only video I have is me yelling at my phone going, it's me. $800, you can't learn my face? Learn my face. The Chinese know my face through TikTok. Why can't you learn my face? but they don't know. We're also on the Neighbors app. If you have the Ring doorbell system, you know that it comes with this Neighbors app, and that's where people post videos of crimes that the Ring doorbell didn't prevent. <laughs> it's the worst commercial for their own product they could have ever come up with. It's just video after video of, hey, look at it not working. Every video is the same. It's a strange man walking right up to the door, looking right into the camera. Uh-huh. Picking up an Amazon package, shaking it a little bit, and then walking off. And everyone has the nerve to put that video on the app, and they go, does anyone know this man? This man stole my Amazon package. Does anyone know this man? I always want to respond and go, no. Nobody knows anyone who steals Amazon packages. Honestly, if you know someone who steals Amazon packages, you also steal Amazon packages. <laughs> no one knows someone who does that on the side. You're either in the syndicate or you aren't. <laughs> Nobody. Nobody's going to look at that and go like, oh, yeah, that's Bill. Uh, he doesn't have his kids on Saturdays, so he likes to troll the neighborhood <laughs> looking for early Christmas gifts. He's a hoot. <laughs> Finally got to uh, take my fiance Emma, to introduce her to my mom. I didn't see her for 13 months because of the pandemic. I was trying to protect her, but that's not how she took it. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's parents were like my mom, but she would call me up. She's like, Zoli, are you coming over for Thanksgiving dinner? And I'm like, no, mom, there's a worldwide pandemic. She's like, okay, if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to come. And I'm like, it's not about me, I'm fine. I just don't want to hurt you. She's like, I understand. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel comfortable. And I'm like, I'm fine, I'm trying to protect you. She's like, I get it, you're a pussy, you're a pussy. It's totally, that is who you are right now. You don't want to visit your mother, you don't visit your mother. who she is. My mom's a great lady. I'm not trying to cast aspersions about her. She's a lovely woman. I actually tried to get her to retire a couple years ago. The comedy was going well. And I was like, hey, mom, why don't you retire? And she's like, I can't. I have to keep going. And I'm like, how much money do you need a month? And she told me. And I'm like, I can give you that. And she goes, oh, you don't have a job. <laughs> I was like, what are you, I'm, I'm a comedian. And she goes, ah, no. <laughs> my mom doesn't believe that this is a job. In my mom's eyes, she comes from communist Hungary. If your name isn't sewn on your t-shirt, you're a carny, all right? <laughs> you're just running some kind of a scam. But I finally got to take my fiance over, and, over to the trailer park and introduce her to my mom. My mom gave her a tour of the trailer. And she showed her my baby pictures on the wall. I have some baby pictures from, uh, from Hungary where I'm naked on the bed. And everything's showing, but the photo is folded at the waist. So you can't see anything. And you can't tell that the photo is folded in the frame. But for some reason, my mom felt the need to explain to my fiancé that I'm naked in that photo. And she goes, Emma, you have to understand in my culture, we show the penis. Okay? That is our culture. We're like, oh, it's a boy. Let me see the... Oh, that's very good. That's a good... Uh, yeah, that's a good one. But then we move to America. Everybody pedophile. So I have to fold the photo. That was the first conversation my fiance had with my mother. I was just standing there going, welcome to the family. You're going to like it here. <laughs> I had a 
a lot of big goals before the pandemic started. A lot of big goals. Like I, early 2019, I was single, and I was like, I think I'm ready to be a dad. That was a real thought that I had, because I'm like, I'm a Delta Platinum Medallion member. It's time to share my knowledge, you know, with the next generation. But I was single, but I'm like, you know what? I was raised by a single mom. I'm used to that. That's how I was raised. It's easy. It's simpler. It's not easier. It's double the work, but it's simpler. You don't have to bounce any punishments off anybody. You know, I was raised by a tiny Hungarian lady in the 90s. She would bust into my room and she'd be like, if you don't finish your homework, I throw Sega Genesis out the window. <laughs> and there wasn't another adult there to go, actually, those are pretty expensive. We should reconsider. She just went ahead and threw my Sega Genesis out the window. And I like that kind of freedom in parenting, you know? So I was like, I want to be a single dad. But then I very quickly found out you can't just start as a single dad. That has to happen organically somehow. You can't just start as a single dad. Like, I can't just go to the orphanage and pick up a kid. I know they don't call them that anymore, but you know what I mean. The, uh, you know, the Children's Humane Society, whatever they call it. I can't go over there and be like, hey, can I get one of the kids? And they'd be like, not only no, but now you're not allowed to parks. How do you feel about that? That's a bummer. A little discriminatory, if you ask me. I still want to be a dad, mainly because I got to see my mom, and I, I remembered how much my mom loves my brother and I. My mom loves my brother and I unconditionally. And what I mean by that is she would rather lie to us and spare our feelings than tell us the truth, and I think that's the right way to parent, you know? Shut up with the truth all the time. Lie a little bit, okay? Like, I have a younger brother, he just turned 21. He still has two parakeets from his childhood, and he thinks those are the original ones. <laughs> and he's very happy, all right? He is so pumped about his Guinness Book of World Record parakeets. <laughs> Here's what happened. When my, when my brother was in the third grade, my mom got him two parakeets as his first pet, but at the same time, she was taking care of the street cat outside. Oh. And one day, well, you know, you see where this is going. <laughs> one day while he's in school and she's at work, that cat snuck in, ate my brother's birds, oh. all right? And she came home from work 30 minutes early and she saw what happened. There's feathers everywhere, there's feathers in the cat's mouth, and there's nothing left. The birds are gone. There's nothing left but two severed parakeet heads at the bottom of the cage. And I know right now you're like, why would you leave that part of the story And That seems unnecessary. Well, it's a key plot point and it's coming up right now. <laughs> She looked at the situation, she looked at her watch, and she's like, I got about a half hour before he gets home from school. So she scooped up the heads in a sandwich bag and ran off to a pet store so she could match them. <laughs> and she called me after the fact, and I'm like, are you insane? And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you ran into a pet store with just severed heads in a sandwich bag? <laughs> Going, I need two of these, stat. And she's like, of course not. I kept them in my jacket. <laughs> So apparently my tiny Hungarian mother went into a pet store with severed parakeet heads in a Ziploc bag in her coat. And when the employee was like, which birds would you like, ma'am? She was like, uh. <laughs> Those two. And then she brought them home, stuffed them in the cage, and swore me to secrecy. And that's the kind of family I want to raise. You know? It's a beautiful family. I mentioned my brother's 21. We have a big age difference, 13 years. And I've realized, looking back at it, that the woman that raised me and the woman that raised my brother, two very different women. Right? I was raised in the 90s. I was raised on Hot Pockets and Jerry Springer. That's what I was raised on. I would come home from school, there'd be a Hot Pocket waiting there, and Jerry Springer would be on, and she'd make me watch it with her. Because she thought it was education, all right? She realized I was growing up without a father. She didn't want me to be naive to the world. She's like, I want you to watch. So I'd watch. I'd, I'd watch and learn. I'd watch a, a little person fist fight a nun. And no matter what happened on the episode, my mom thought it was a good show, because at the end of every episode, Jerry would go, uh, remember everybody, love yourselves and each other. And my mom would be like, you see, he's a good man. That's how I was raised, all right? Now cut to a few years later, my brother comes along. My mom's a different woman, you know? No more hot pockets in the house, she's health conscious. Now there's kale and she bought that juicer from the guy with the eyebrows. And no more Jerry Springer. Now she's watching Oprah and Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz. And whatever they're selling, she's buying. 
Like, I don't know if you guys remember, but like 10 years ago, people stopped using deodorant for a minute because they said deodorant might cause cancer. So instead, people started using a holistic rock. It was just a rock. It did nothing. And you rubbed it under your pits and your close family and friends had to lie to you. That's what it was. Well, my mom got heavy into that at the same time. My poor brother hit puberty. All right. Yeah. And I found it yeah, during the great deodorant ban at the trailer park. <laughs> And I found out while we were at the movies, our thing was to watch the Marvels movies, so we're sitting there, and I'm just sitting there going, it smells, like, what is, it smells like sweet death in here. What is that? You guys remember being 12? That's the smelliest you've ever been in your life. Everyone smells like an onion patch at that age. And I looked at him, I'm like, is that you? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, what happened? You didn't shower? And he goes, I showered. I'm like, you didn't put deodorant on? He goes, I put deodorant on. I'm like, what the hell did you use? And he goes, the holistic rock. And I'm like, that doesn't work. And he's like, oh, I'm well aware. <laughs> and I go, you go to school smelling like that? And he's like, yeah, and I get picked on every day. And that hurt my heart, because I know how mean middle school kids are. And I'm like, no more. As soon as that movie was over, we went straight to a CVS and I bought him a six pack of Old Spice. And we had to smuggle it into my mother's house like it was marijuana. And I showed him where to hide it, under his mattress. And then for the next four years, I became my brother's deodorant dealer. Where he would just text me, I'm out. And I'm like, I'm on it. And I would just show up with deodorant in a dirty brown bag and throw it through his window as I waved to my mother on the way out. That's the kind of family I want to raise, you know? My mom and I never told my brother about his parakeets. My brother and I never told her about the deodorant. I have no idea what they're keeping from me. And we're all happy. Thanksgiving now is smooth. If we do catch each other's eye, we just go, right there. Like, it's beautiful. You guys are fun, man. I don't know, I know the last couple of years has been hard, but I always try to look at the positive side of it. During the pandemic, I got into a lot of new things. There's things that I still stick with, you know? First thing I got into during the pandemic was edibles. They were great. <laughs> Never really done them before, but now they're like, they're legal. And I'm like, let me give them a gander, you know? <laughs> they're wonderful. I can't believe they were ever illegal. <laughs> it's just a little gummy bear, and you put it in, and you feel joy for no reason. <laughs> just from your heart, you feel joy. Next thing you know, you're giggling by yourself in the kitchen on a Tuesday afternoon, <laughs> and your fiance comes by and goes, what are you laughing at? And you go, ha, what? <laughs> it's great. The other thing we got into was murder documentaries. Murder documentaries on Netflix. We got heavy into murder documentaries on Netflix. I've watched so many, I feel like I can get away with one. <laughs> That's how many we've watched. We love them. But we've watched so many that like, I can now tell that the edibles have a side effect and that my memory is not as sharp. Because my fiance and I, we watch them as soon as Netflix drops them. So when we're done, Netflix doesn't have one to recommend us that we haven't already watched, but because of all the edibles we've taken, they end up showing us one that we've already watched. But because of all the edibles we've taken, we can't tell for about 45 minutes into that one that we've already watched it, you know? So for the first 45 minutes, that guy just looks awfully familiar to me. I'm just sitting there going, I think I went to high school with that guy. And then I finally go, hot damn, we've already watched it, man. The final thing I got into during the pandemic was Popeye's chicken. Heavily into Popeye's chicken. We used to Uber Eats the hell out of Popeye's chicken. I remember, uh, this is before we lived together, but one time Emma ordered Popeye's chicken for lunch when I wasn't over and sent me a photo kind of bragging about it. I'm like, good for you, you know? And that night I came over and we put on the Netflix, you know, dum dum, it comes on. Would you, you ever have the TV too loud and you know that big, and it's, it's like a countdown to a bomb and you're like, where the hell's the room? We're gonna blow the windows out of this joint. <laughs> so, we're sitting there, dum dum, and we take an edible, it kicks in. And after a few minutes, I was like, hey, is there any more of that Popeye's chicken left? <laughs> and she goes, no, it's all gone. I was like, damn. She's like, there is one biscuit left. And I'm like, hell yeah. And she's like, but it's in the trash. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Is it near the top? Like, how, how in the trash is it? Because I still remember that episode of Seinfeld where Costanza ate it off the top and I took his side in that situation. 
So I'm like, is it near the top? And she's like, kinda. I'm like, all right, let's go see what you mean by kinda. <laughs> so I'm walking into the kitchen pretty high and I'm fantasizing about what I want the trash to look like when I get there. And what I'm fantasizing about is like a little paper wastebasket under an office desk with just plastic lining and one biscuit, right? Because that's, that's not even eating a biscuit out of the trash. That's just an oddly wrapped biscuit. That's all that is. So that's what I'm fantasizing about. Then I get to the kitchen, I open the trash, and it's never been more full. And I'm like, damn. And right on top was a box of Popeyes, but I opened it and it was just chicken bones. And I checked, but she was thorough, all right? <laughs> Some people are wasteful with chicken, but she was thorough. There was nothing left. I moved that box out of the way. Then I saw the second box, and in my heart, I'm like, that's where the biscuit is. But it looked like she had to make room in the trash, so it looked like she punched it in. <laughs> like the sides of the box were blown out, and there was like a tea bag on the lid. I remember flicking a tea bag off the lid and out loud going, who the hell has hot tea with fried chicken? Who is this person? <laughs> And as I'm lifting the lid in my head, I'm like, what are you doing right now? You're a 34-year-old man with a smartphone. You can order fresh Popeyes. It'll be here in six minutes. And then I took a bite, and I'm like, no, that was worth it. That was amazing. You guys have been great. Thank you so much for coming out. Good night, everybody.